Okay, we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hope, thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, my name is Nick Neely. I'm an assistant professor of English writing uh, here at Eastern Oregon University in La Grande. And welcome to this uh, Sandra and Carl Elliston Ars Poetica Fun reading uh, Sunday matinee featuring poets David Axelrod and Patricia Clark. Um, just going to give everyone another minute uh, to settle in uh, before we get started. And as we do that, I'm going to share uh, a few uh, notes and links in the chat um, and also share screen briefly to show off um, some of our web pages here. Um, okay. Bear with me. Um, so I just wanted to first uh, show you our, our homepage for this visiting writer series, the, the Ars Poetica um, reading series. Um, we've got one upcoming event uh, uh, on December 2nd with novelist and essayist Ben Ehrenreich, um, who will be talking about Desert Notebooks, his, uh, his latest book from Counterpoint. Um, the registration link will be available to that shortly. It's, a, it's another um, midday event, uh, 12 p.m. on a Thursday, December 2nd, and hope you'll be able to uh, join us for that. Um, also, just to note that we now have uh, uh, our events from this spring. Um, here available for your for your viewing pleasure. And uh, as well, uh, we have a YouTube channel that you could subscribe to so that those the if you miss a reading, they'll they'll come to you. Um, here's here's Ben Ehrenreich's uh, book Desert Notebooks just to, to pitch it. He's a great writer. Um, hope you'll visit a visit then with him and us. Um, and then finally, uh, if you're on Twitter, hope you follow the uh, writing program's uh, Upstart Twitter account, um, which will help you receive news about events and more program news. Also, we just share events and opportunities that will be of interest to, to students, professional writers, and beyond. Uh, so I'll stop sharing screen at, at this point. And, um, We'll set sail. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, I wanted to begin with a, uh, a brief land acknowledgement since many of us uh, are here in La Grande where EOU is sited. Um, we humbly acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land Eastern Oregon University is upon, the Cayuse, Umatilla, Walla Walla, and Nez Perce people. We celebrate their traditions, languages, and stories. We acknowledge their continuing connection to this land, water, and community and pay our respects to these original stewards of Northeastern Oregon. Um, and now it's a real pleasure to introduce poets uh, Patricia Clark and David Axelrod, who will read in that order. Um, I'll introduce them in turn. So first I'll, I'll introduce Patricia. And um, once she's finished with her reading, I'll introduce uh, David. Um, Patricia Clark is the author of six books of poetry, most recently, Self-Portrait with a Million Dollars, which from Terrapin Books uh, last year. She'll be reading from that today. Her previous book, The Canopy, also from Terrapin, won the 2018 PSV North American uh, Poetry Book Award. She's also the author of three chapbooks. Um, she has won the Fourth, Fourth Rivers Folio Competition, Mississippi Review's Poetry Prize, among others. Um, and she has uh, completed residencies at the McDowell, McDowell Colony, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, the Ragdale Colony, and the Tyrone Guthrie Center uh, in Ireland. Uh, she was the Poet Laureate of Grand Rapids, Michigan from 2005 to 2007. She teaches, or well, uh, she did teach, she's now retired. <laughs> Uh, in the writing department at the Grand Valley State University in Michigan, where she, she lives in, Grand, in uh, Grand Rapids. And uh, for many years, she was the coordinator for Poetry Night, for Poetry Night, Poetry Night, excuse me, part of GBSU's Fall Arts Celebration. Um, 
Patricia, thank you so much for being with us today. So looking forward to your reading. Great, am I on then? I guess I am. Great, thank you, Nick. And um, I have to say, I'm delighted to be reading reading for you all today and sharing the airwaves. Maybe airwaves is not the right word. The digital airwaves uh, with David Axelrod, who, uh, whose work I've admired over the years. And now we share a publisher, Ter Terrapin Books. And just a brief commercial announcement for those books, because uh, um, if you think of purchasing things, uh, uh, buying a book is a vote for books. And I think that's really important to say. And we would sure appreciate your support. It's been tough in the pandemic, although I hear that people are buying more physical books than electronic books. And I, I like that a lot. So. Uh, Nick has very kindly put some links in the in the chat for uh, Terrapin and maybe a couple of bookstores. So do what you can. I don't even consider the money I spend on books to be real money. I figure that's just, you know, and that's really what writers have to do is buy each other's books. Um, and relatives do too. I think they sometimes they think because you're a writer, you get free books and, um, uh, from your publisher. And you know, people in your family have to remember to buy a book too, if, if you don't mind my saying that. Um, Heather Swan was going to be reading with us. This is her book, um, A Kinship with Ash. And so I wanted to start by reading one of her poems. Uh, she couldn't join us today because of various technical difficulties. So this is a poem called Pesticide 7, Victor. The handfuls of de dead bees she finds after the spraying are not the worst part for the beekeeper. It's the bees still struggling that gets to her, limping in a circle like someone who's been spinning on a tire swing for too long who then stands, dizzy, nauseous, stunned. Their wings shudder, but they cannot fly. These insects whose bodies know the whose alchemy gives us liquid gold, whose love affairs with pistols and stamens give us apricots, almonds, melons. To witness is to be dredged, she thinks. What war do we think we're winning? If you ever read just the warnings on a, on a container of pesticides, you have to stop in your tracks because it's too scary what they warn you about. You just don't even want to go on and use it. I thought I would uh, start with the opening poems in my book, and I would tell you a couple of things about the opening poems because it helps you as a reader um, listen to the poems and understand what's happening, I think. And um, I have a poem that precedes the, the, the three sections, or actually I think it's four sections in my book, I forget. Yeah, it's four. Um, and the poem is called Coaster. And I guess I'd, I'd like to say that from the beginning that even though I've lived in Michigan for 30 plus years, I'm a, I'm a Pacific Northwest person by, by heart and by blood. You know how they say that a little chicken gets imprinted on the first thing that they see and thinks that's their mother. I think that happened to me with the landscape out there. And so I'm a saltwater person even though I like rivers and stuff and, uh, and a mountain person. So um, I'll, I'll read this poem called Coaster, which really started from an actual physical coaster, the kind of thing you put a, a drink on, but then it took on that other meaning too. So this is called Coaster. If a gift could mark a time, if a square of some ceramic substance backed with cork could be the emblem of a turn, then this nails it. Four inches by four, a creamy tan and stamped on its face 
the Puget Sound map and all the cities of my heart. Sailing chart shown with depths as though useful for navigation, land painted orange, water shown in white with inlets in blue. If it doesn't go far enough north or most especially west to Port Angeles, La Push, still it makes explicit what is lost, sore. Sibling chart two of who lives where, Olympia, Lacey, Tacoma, everyone else to the north and two exiles, Chris and me. To rest a coffee cup upon, to steady a hand, Flying in this time, seeing the Rockies, brown, and then the Cascade Mountains, angular, sharp, with valleys filled up with tumbling fog, thick as though it were soup. Ladle this, I tried to say, each time overcome by something large, the mountains seemed to pull out of me, knowing it was there, fearing my eyes would fill right then in the aisle seat of row, row 32. Escarpment, Arite, it's where you must stand to look out and down, the most dangerous foothold of all, the past in front of you, like a map, no map, the slope, precipitous, basalt, pumice lapilli, glass. And then um, the first poem in the book uh, is called Feasting Then. And one of the big challenges of, of putting together a book of poems, of course, is arranging the poems in some kind of manner that's pleasing. And I think of, of a particular arrangement as an arc that will draw you into a book and into the subjects and then down into, into something, whatever that something is, and then bring you out by the end with any luck, like with really great fiction, you're changed maybe by the end. Um, and I think the other thing I would say is, um, I do a lot of bird watching, but I don't, I'm not a professional bird watcher, but I think I'm a professional watcher. And maybe writers have to, have to be that, maybe poets especially. So often you'll see in these poems, I'm in the stance of, I'm watching stuff and seeing stuff. And if you look carefully, I think in the ordinary world, there's amazing things to see. And we, we need, I, I speak uh, to myself too, to take the time to look more than we do. So this is called feasting then. High in the canopy, feasting, then falling. A controlled drop in flight to a lower branch. I watched without understanding, with awe. I've been shut in those houses too, or blind at work, not noticing. All the inattention when a miracle takes place nearby and could save us. Do I really mean save? You must believe me, the feasting on some tree fruit high up and the bird I think either a flycatcher or a wax wing. Such moves, so much cascading in confidence, such lifting of the beak to sing. Yes, I mean save. I just gotta flip my page here so that I know what I'm doing. Um, sometimes um, I think one of the moments I had with students of one of the great connections with students is I would told them once that my dog was, was close to the end of her life. And my students, it was amazing how many students in a particular semester were losing their dogs. And one day they said to me, Can we, could we put all the pictures up on, on the computer and look at them all? And I think we did. And it was really worth it. I consider that to be time well spent in a class. So you see where my prejudices lie. This is called canine elegy. All over town, dogs are lying down for the last time. How many bright balls lost in grass, frisbees sent spinning on air. What shall be done with crate and leash, collar, basket of toys, 
blanket for sitting in the car. All over town, dogs are lying down. We mark her life as she left in turn, marks on things she chewed, Christmas tree, string of lights, chair legs, and on us too. She never dug holes in the yard, refused to run after the woodchuck I told her to chase or kill. She bolted once or twice after deer. All over town, dogs are lying down for the final time. Who do we grieve for, them or for ourselves? We scrub their bowls, the rug, hang up the leash. Will there be a next dog? Mostly, she did anything I asked, jumped a hurdle or leapt onto a fallen log. If ever I hurt her, it was an accident. Foot I stepped on in the dark hair clipped too close. Dogs are lying down to rest forever all over town, Molly, Rafe, and Scout, giving up their last breaths, leaving us to applaud how avid for life they were, even as eyes clouded, hips gave way on stairs. Images stay, dog pushing her muzzle into snow, licking the face of a veteran, hunched in a wheelchair at the park, or sitting to let a child touch her velvet ear. Fur lies in corners of the house, sticky like burrs on clothes. Dogs are lying down in places all over town and us with them at the last. I think I went one year on a butterfly count and it was really fun. The ranger assured us in a short time we could identify a few butterflies and we were supposed to count them and it was gonna help with uh, habitat loss. This is called bragged. Warm wooden leg of a table, August sun and the red admiral staying there, flexing its wings yellow pear tomatoes turning gold hour by hour, and the woods still green, but somehow more somber each day, though I try staying just here in this moment, breathing, watching, living. What part of us wants to measure or compare? This year against last, this year's tomato yield over last, I lean back in the red chair, soaking up heat. I touch the dog's black, silky ear. We are specks in this speck of time. Tonight, the Perseids. We whirl together just for now. This dance, this stardust, light on a wing. I don't know if you can trust what writers, what poets especially say in uh, their poems. You know, I think Plato, he didn't want poets in the Republic and maybe there's something to that. But I'm pretty sure this happened. I got a letter one day and the city or the county, they were gonna do a controlled burn somewhere near us. So I thought this is too good, I have to write a poem. And I think this has some humor. I hope, you, I hope you can hear it. It's called Controlled Burn. It came in the mail, an official looking letter with the seal of our government, or at least a county agency in charge of setting fires, putting them out. It described a strip of land across the highway from us. They defined what a swale was, saying this is it and they told what they hoped to burn out. Though now my memory grows uncertain. Mustard garlic for one, purple loosestrife perhaps, and a plant called knuckleweed maybe, or was it knucklehead? They wanted us to know to stay clear of the area on a certain date or to object in writing if we had concerns. Their promises grew large, the watershed would be enlarged, color and flavor of the water improved. And I'm sure they said we would all sleep better at night, though that seems a stretch. It came about just as they said, 
the date came and passed. We saw a little smoke, nothing more. One day we drove over just to see, and the strip once green was now burnt black. A sign told the tale. Our water never changed, and our dreams were as fractured as before. No one I knew remembered a thing. And that was before the Trump White House. So <clears throat> one thing about uh, studying in Montana, I, I didn't mention that before, but I got to study with Dick Hugo and some other great writers, Madeline DeFries. And Dick, Dick's mantra, of course, and it was a good one, um, was that in a poem, you needed to follow the music. And he wasn't much for saying, you figure out, get, impart some kind of message. He didn't believe in that at all. <laughs> he was really into follow the, the music and it would lead you to a deeper truth, a sonic truth that was better than anything you could come up with. <clears throat> so I try that in some poems. And this one is called My Last Brother's Last Son. And the title reads into the first line, my last brother's last son drives off to college, leaving behind Douglas firs, rocky beaches of Puget Sound for Half Moon Bay, Bodega Bay and California sun. Will he return? My brother's last son goes off. We're all empty nesters now, whether we had kids or not. Same footing, same grief. Rooms where we live gathering dust, mattresses and pillows holding the shape of who's gone, a few shoes left in closets, books, an old dog pining in the fence yard. When my last brother's last son goes off driving away, we find ourselves grieving too. Another childhood gone, a wife or husband to look at over coughing, coffee, wondering where did we leave off? When is the last time we sat together, talking, intimate? My brother's two sons go away in different directions. One goes east, the others goes south down the coast. They're both playing music loud. It's all about joy, mostly theirs, some ours, but it drowns out conveniently the worry, grief too. No more going back, commencement bay, only a sure track moving ahead. When Michael's last son goes away, I remember the year he was born, not his son, but him, our mother, 42, and birthing a kid started from an old egg, she without fear, no genetic testing for her. Michael arriving in a squall, perfect, and whole, last boy, 10 fingers and toes, carrot red hair. When my last brother's last son goes away, there's quiet in bedroom, kitchen, halls, the yard, our hearts, space to let the unknown in, to grasp what comes next. The dog lies down at the gate. I probably ought to put a few cats in my poems. I think uh, I have in other poems. You'll have to go back and read some earlier ones. Um, I'm probably as political as most of you, and I hope you are, And but sometimes it doesn't work into poems. I'm not overtly, I don't seem to be able to do that in poems overtly, but sometimes things in nature resonate and things come out that way, and I'm happy they do. And I think mallards are probably the, the dullest of ducks, but <laughs> so it is. This is called Mallards at Rest. The woods, regal in copper, russet, gold, and the air seemingly spun gold, though it's November. Over planks of the bridge, we cross the lagoon, where down below, Along water's edge, mallards have tucked wings, feathers, and heads. Only green on their crowns shows. I know any moment they could startle up into ducks, 
for now they linger as feathers over warm bodies asleep in a world easily able to harm them. Like sleeping children or any group of innocents, let them rest for now. The dispossessed, lost, astray, wayward travelers who if they can find peace for a nap in shade, let them be. You never really know where poems are going to come out. And I think it's in, in my universe, the longer I write, I'm more open to them coming from lots of different sources. So this one happened exactly like the title says. At random, I opened the book on waking, dreaming, being to the chapter on dying. It's a day ahead on my calendar, shielded in mystery. How odd, I think, and how wondrous. If I could learn not to fear it, if I could embrace it. I look out on this day, gray shuddering down the green, filled with bird song, mostly cardinals and a lone wren, and a sudden downpour of heavy drops. That brought out the robins to sip up the rain from the driveway. In this way, Everything is useful. When I go, some extra air will be around to be breathed by somebody else, maybe an orca or a child, maybe a grizzled dog. My mother had this belief um, and she was kind of a fanatic about it that salt water was a healing thing. And no matter what beach you were at, and no matter how cold it was, she recommend, highly recommended, really demanded that you go in the water because she felt that that was the proper thing to do. Um, and I don't know if there's scientific belief about healing. And probably there is, because she was wise about many other things. <clears throat> so this was a news story that was a sad one. And um, I think kind of showed how foolish we are to think that humans are, are superior to animals, um, because clearly we're not. This is called After Reading About the Orca and Its Calf. Maybe it isn't salt water that heals my mother's theory, but the mere going down to the sea, removing your shoes, a way of humbling yourself before forces larger than, deeper than, stronger than. Once I body surfed in Lake Superior. When a wave smashed me, I crawled out of the water. Maybe it isn't that we're cruel. If we believe that all the other creatures hurt too, what a weight of grief. I regret killing the spider on the gray dashboard of my car. It looked for a home. The Seattle Times said the orca carried her calf for a week, refusing to let the dead thing go. Finally, she let the sea take it. And I thought I'd end with the title poem of my, from my book, um, Self Portrait with a Million Dollars. Um, they used to have world fairs. I don't, I don't know when that stopped, but um, there was one in Seattle when I was a kid and it was really great. And, uh, and they were gonna bring, you know, the, the world's fair was exciting enough and relatives were gonna fly in, but I got fixated because they said um, they were going to bring a million dollars in silver dollars to the fair and the, the freeways were just being built. That's about how old I am. And it was really great. I persuaded my father to go over when they said that the million dollars would be coming by. And this is the poem that I ended up getting out of memory after a long time. Self-portrait with a million dollars. Near a painted boulder with names of teams, high schools, sits the exit we take now to the graves. 
near the hill scotch broom gold, that roaming place, the sometimes swamp, where I see myself with my small brothers, three of us holding hands. Near the heart of it all, the family whole, before anyone was sundered, though Anne was about to leave us. A glimpser outside, leaning over to kiss a boy in a red car. It was so long ago, there weren't zip codes or cell phones or the internet, and the World's Fair was in Seattle, our grandmother flying in elegant hat and white gloves from Boston. Muscle memory holds so much, landscape memory too. That overpass, exit, boulder, hill, with a convoy motoring west, how for months I begged father to take us to see it. A million dollars in silver dollars coming out of the east, a police escort guiding it to the fair. Near the railing next to father, I stood watching while a semi blew past, dirt kicking up pollen, road dust, freeway still being built. A motor parade gone, in an eye blink. I hadn't understood. I'd never see a single silver gleaming coin. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. What a, what a thing, a million dollars in <laughs> silver dollars. Um, they I did take it out at the fair and I did get to see it there. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad you did get to see it. <laughs> It would have been a real letdown. Yeah. Um, that was a wonderful reading. Um, everyone should uh, uh, check out Patricia's book. There's a link again in the in the chat. Um, and uh, and uh, hope you'll have some questions for her um, at the end of our program today. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague uh, David Axelrod and to welcome him back. Uh, to virtual Legrand. Um, David Axelrod was a longtime professor of English writing here at Eastern Oregon University, and I'm sure many of you encountered him. Um, he's, he's now more than a year into his semi-retirement uh, because he remains the director of EOU's MFA program in creative writing and its uh, concentration in wilderness, ecology, and community. Um, and he's, he steers the program now from his new home in Missoula, Montana. David is the author of nine collections of poetry, most recently, Years Beyond the River, out from Terrapin Books this fall, which I'll be reading from today, um, as well as The Open Hand, his second latest, um, from University of Washington Press in 2017. Uh, additionally, he's the author of two collections of nonfiction, The Eclipse I Call Father and Troubled, Troubled Intimacies, both from Oregon State University Press, uh, he was the longtime editor of the Salt, the Journal of Fine and Literary Arts, and I think he remains a contributing editor for Lynx House Press. David, it's a delight to, uh, to have you here this afternoon. Please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nick. Uh, it's great having you as a colleague, I have to say. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Patricia, it's great to have read it with you uh, for the first time. Um, uh, after all these years, uh, she graduated the year I arrived in Montana, so she's a member of that legendary group of people who preceded me in the end of, uh, uh, of everything that was happening. No. I mean, legendary. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for being here, uh, uh, whoever you are, uh, showing up this afternoon on a Sunday. I, uh, like uh, Patricia, I, I want to begin with a poem by uh, Heather Swan, and uh, it's from her new book, uh, but it was first published in Basalt magazine, so thank you very much for mentioning Basalt, uh, Nick, um, and uh, it, it's pretty self-explanatory. I don't need to say a great deal. It's called, In Which I Begin to Bargain. For my plastic bottle, the albatross. For my forelane, seeds unbound. For my cotton quilt, the many years of backs, the many years of hands. 
for my wireless, some silence. For my tortilla chips, the fields of daisies, the fields of Queen Anne's lace. For my gas cap, the polar bear, the harbor seal, the tern. For my thermostat, the mountaintops of Kentucky and West Virginia. For my perfect lawn, frogs. For my insecticide, the songbirds' eggs, the butterflies, the bees. For my fossil fuel, the fossils, the strata, undisturbed. For my palm oil, the orangutan. For my mascara, the rabbits, the mice. And for my smartphone, Congo. For my blue jeans, the seamstresses and their eyes, their children, their hands. For my many myths, the crows, the bats, the rattlesnakes, the spiders. For my jet plane, the coral reefs, the mollusks of many shapes. And for my mirror, skies. I, uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> Tricia, that's a, that's a political poem. <laughs> you know, uh, I, um, but I, 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 I like that idea, uh, the self having to bargain um, with the self about our moment uh, when our, the subject has changed. Uh, you know, human beings are no longer the subject. Uh, we are uh, we're, uh, in a world ruled by things so much larger than us. And I think uh, in years beyond the river, that's exactly what I, I wanted to try getting at it, these other very large finitudes that we find ourselves immersed in. Um, and, but I, I thought I'd start with a poem that in a way kind of speaks back to uh, Heather's poem um, about the optimism that uh, uh, is in one column of, uh, he, uh, of that poem uh, and uh, how we could live in a world uh, of infinite growth. It's called At the Wellhead. This is very much a Grand Ronde River poem, Grand Ronde Valley uh, poem, At the Wellhead. There was going to be a world of increase and jubilee, prolific shade, afternoons full of exponential ease beside a stream and trout skittering away like faces erased from the final measure of a dream. We all waited for that, even the dead who puzzled over sigils, scored into stone someone forgotten now, raised at a crossroads long ago. There was going to be justice the unity of one and the infinity of June. Irrigation wheels in grain fields singing their work songs, their casual ch ch ch, and a silver mist risen from the steadfast darkness inside earth would drench the skift of emergent wheat and us too, the partisans of these manifold and bumper yields. So I, I, I was also uh, thinking that there are many, many other kinds of bargaining that go on in as much as uh, Heather's poem is bargaining with the future. Um, I mean, there are a lot of people who bargain with the past um, uh, in, in our moment. Um, and this is a poem for them. It's called Apostles of Eminence. We sometimes meet people who don't want to live in the present, in their darned sweaters, patched trousers, long hair lifting in wind. They seem startled when we happen upon them in the forest, bogged down along 20 miles of drifted road. Their wagon minus its wheels, the woman holds the team of sway-backed horses as her man repacks axle bearings in muskrat grease. They have grown pale with self-reliance and want to relitigate the past 
argue history. They are full of praise for hand-forged nails, the striking of movable type, the lathing of hames. Though for them, hope went extinct, a feathered thing, circa 1970. And now, stranded in latter days, they bear the melancholy burden of the past and warn us there is a future only they, drilled in privation, can abide. For the time being, though, would we help, should we help them pull them free, they will barter with us. Goat cheese wrapped in oilcloth, wild honeycomb, a pint of bitters. We accepted the bitters, <laughs> as it turns out, of course. Um, but uh, one of the things uh, I think that's going on in uh, Years Beyond the River, and uh, Patricia's already warned you not to believe anything that comes out, <laughs> out of our mouths. <laughs> if we say it's one thing, it's probably just the opposite. Uh, but uh, one of the things I, I, I was aiming for was just um, trying to imagine, imagine a world beyond the human subject um, and, uh, and how those, uh, those other uh, larger entities might regard us. Uh, this is a, a poem uh, called As the Mountain Dreams It. And uh, if any of you were there in Eastern Oregon, uh, you may have hiked somewhere in the vicinity of uh, Eagle Cap Peak, which I, uh, I misname in this poem. There, there, there you go, uh, proof, uh, uh, Patricia. <laughs> Never take anything quite at, at face value. As the mountain dreams it, there it is. A glimpse of it anyway, rising above the intervening ridge, the dome of Glacier Peak and headwaters of five rivers we live alongside of in all our feckless shambles and uproar, Johnny's come lately, ghosts of a language never learned. At dusk, the mountain divides shadows cast by its north-facing cirque from alpenglow lifting along its southwest flank. There it is, the world as the mountain dreams it, going on after as it went on before us. Spikes of elk sedge and calf brain poking through duff at the edge of July snowbanks, a white bark pine nut splitting its seed coat. Centuries later, inside a nutcracker's hoard, the fascicles unfurling five elegant seed leaves, a little asterisk on a mountain that lost its glacier. If people live inside some spectral order, does it matter how or how long we abide here? Does whatever the mountain dreams end without us, if it wakes in a world we set afire? Um, of course, uh, as we all know, the world is very much set afire. And um, I thought just a, a couple poems about that. Um, and uh, this is called uh, Late August in the Okanagan. In the wake of the fire front, the stench of ashes, skeletal pines, teenage boys sit inside an idling sedan at the gas station and can't believe their luck. A Colville girl who, though she puts on a hard, brave face, cannot refuse. She stares straight ahead at steers and ponies, seared obscenities lying on their bloated sides, dotting paddocks, and pretends she is merciless. We belong to no other family, and this idea of ourselves inside a fireproof house. Think of us sitting here as fire sweeps through cheatgrass, as bitter brush explodes, the heat turned back by mud walls and tempered glass. Think of this world, 
that caught fire, each of us crazy to open the door and throw ourselves into flames. Um, I, I was going to, uh, there's that one, but I think I'll just move right on. Uh, it's, uh, I don't want to take too much time here. Um, but of course, there, we have this refugee problem, and, um, uh, and uh, that is a result so much of uh, this larger uh, uh, influences uh, now that are run amok. Um, and so this is a poem called The Northern Sorrow Monkey. It begins with a long epigraph uh, from uh, the field guide to North American monkeys. Simia dolores borealis, rare across its range, prefers highland forests near open water, matrilineal, not gregarious, forms loose knit groups only when young are present, otherwise solitary, retreats to isolated refuges in mature trees, Browses mistletoe, club moss, horsetail, lungwort where available. Hemlock and red cedar provide important winter forage. Individuals observe taking salamanders and tree frogs, grief, 1949. Typically silent though, when mating, copulatory vocalizations sound imitative of and sometimes are confused with the melancholy yodels and harsh howls of others with whom it shares its range. We heard it howl from the beach below, and moments later, another answered from Crummelt's high on the moonlit ridge. The moon path led away down the grassy lake to falls we planned to portage days later. Hemlocks robed in witch's beard stood around us, attentive as we were, startled, awake, and afraid of those daunted cries. And we remembered a song around first learned in kindergarten. No, not now, not for you, probably never. For the sorrow monkey too, brooding in its dwindled sliver of life, crowded out by refugees from a world on fire. Nothing else is possible beyond the already known. There will be no adventuring forth, only hammering back into the familiar whole. No achievement, no infinite theorem or hundredth monkey, limits only. The falls are the border never dared, and the range of its roar cascading over cliffs, the moonlit dome of mist, rapids churning below, all remind how the farther a sorrow monkey roves, the louder the overawing rebuke. Well, that's my imaginary refugee, or one who can't quite be a refugee. But uh, uh, if I said get down to sort of the brass tacks uh, of a similar situation, uh, daunting situation with a successful outcome. Uh, this is called Crossing into the Deep North. The first time my sister faced the nothingness of the sea, she pulled me close and vowed she'd swim. And there she goes on skis now into snowy pines at dusk. This private light we learned about after internment. Her mind is smooth with ferocity. She distrusts maps, but for all the inscrutable ones unfolded before her. In a small town just over the border, a woman watched my sister fret over denominations of coins and pointed to the correct fare for two in my upturned palm. We heard a recital on the radio that night, and my sister wondered why the pianist played a pulse of dark chords. Is only one hand full of grief? In this country, they say we are asleep 
in our outer selves. But my sister is teaching me to jump. Be brave, she says, I'll catch you. We've traveled as far as everyone else with wings and the morning chorus reaches deeper north every day. There is my sister again, treading water below the diving board I'm shivering at the end of. In the blue light at the natatorium, I feel sometimes afraid, but I love my sister. It's almost spring where we came from, and here too, we smell the ocean in the wind. I'm just going to read two more. Um, this one I, I, I dedicate uh, to Heather Swan. Uh, uh, she was visiting EOU a couple of years ago in the spring, and we took uh, students uh, in one of my courses out for a, a field trip and uh, uh, along a, a stream that was being restored uh, by the Forest Service. And the, some of the research scientists who were involved were there um, that day as well when we took this walk <laughs> in uh, just the most drenching rain. <laughs> But it's called, uh, uh, we're standing on the green line. As fine rain falls the length of Meadow Creek, porous, scattered blue, everything in five dimensions dissolves into it. Sedges, and bunch grass, us, the marsh wren's song, yellow violets and sink foils, the pink hair of prairie smoke, opening at our feet. My friend's voice nearby urges dogwoods to hold the creek bank in place. Heal the skin of the small world torn open centuries ago, its people murdered or driven away, returning now. It takes that long for violence to end, for a scent this sweet and damp to guide us back to what's steadfast, even in its half-year absence. The lost and dear tremble awake like a bumblebee nest beneath our hands. Our life aboard this rotting boat, someone long ago scuttled near shore, has grown new mass fore and aft, and it sails a green mist filled with the heat of the hive and glimmering with the wings of bees. One of uh, Heather's books is um, about bees. She has a, a book of prose uh, that I highly recommend uh, about uh, bees uh, and uh, bees and art. Uh, and it, it's a really, uh, really lovely book. Um, and I'll just end with this. This is called Lastness. The first word lived inside of everything then. A buoyant music we rouse to touch the porous surfaces of, and it's rising through us again, gathering flecks of clay from the bottoms of wells, gravity drenching us in a twilight room. Acrobatic vowels warble across a child's tongue, answering another child lost to us now who tasted honey from that hive. Our faces bestirred by the old quarrels of Sheol, we don't want to forget last things, the station crowded every day with departures. Lifetimes a thousand deep trail us, little bits of ourselves sloughed in rooms, farm fields, the villages left behind, the snowbound forests under whose canopies we sheltered with migrants, runaways, unmoored men. And here we are, besotted again at this blue hour, your hair falling red all around us, the held and beheld in the storm of last things.
Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, David. You're welcome. <laughs> Beautiful phones. Uh, check out David's new book. Again, the link is in, in the chat. Um, uh, if, if there are questions for our wonderful readers, um, go ahead and put those in the chat or in uh, the Q&A box and we'll, we'll get to those. Uh, I, I had an opening question, if you'd be willing to entertain it, Patricia and David, which is you know, open-ended. Uh, Patricia mentioned that as she gets older, she's open to poems from um, an increasing array of, of sources. And I, I wondered if you felt that way um, to David, and, and also if both of you could uh, maybe describe some of the some of the you know sources that your poems come from, and some of the sources that have maybe most surprised you lately. Hmm. I want to kind of defer to you, uh, Patricia. You're the one who brought it up. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I um, I. Just, I'm, I'm thinking of someone who I read or heard who, maybe it was William Stafford who said, if you're having trouble writing a poem, uh, you need to step out of the way. And um, I do sometimes think we get in the way of, um, of opportunities. So um, I'm just, I want to include as much of the world in my poems as possible. So I guess that's part of where I'm going with saying many different sources. I'd like to get the vocabulary of all kinds of things into my poems. Cause I don't think there's a, you know, it's not just hearts and flowers and Queen Anne's lace, you know, there's, there's shit in the world and all of that, all of that needs to go in here too, somehow. And so I don't usually, I try to bring in more language that I haven't used before and maybe roughen up the music a little bit more than I have in the past. So um, I don't think I'm answering your question yet, but I just hear different things say on the news or people talking. And I think that's a poem where I don't think I thought the same thing 20 years ago. It's a wonderful thing about having longevity as a writer. I hope David agrees because you have you have a lot to look back on and how you thought about poems. And um, I'm not sure mine has changed that much. I don't think it has, um, but I, I would like to include more and more of subject matter that I haven't written about before. Yeah, I endorse all of that absolutely. Uh, I, I um, my my students maybe know uh, some ridiculous argument. I try to always voice on the <laughs> source of what poems are. I always tell them the poem is waiting in the world for its poet uh, to pass by, uh, and that the uh, the sources uh, of poems uh, often have almost nothing to do with us besides our awareness, our attention to things. Uh, around us. And, I like that. I like yeah. that. And I, I, uh, I, uh, and I, I also uh, very much endorse Dick Hugo's view that you just follow the music. Uh, I mean, staff, his friend Stafford said much the same. And I am always, uh, I, I used to always love sitting in a classroom when we sat in classrooms. Uh, and uh, and we, let's do a writing exercise. <laughs> and, you know, like, you get this blank piece of paper there, and the next thing you know, you it's not blank anymore. It's like covered yeah. over, written yeah. upwards and downwards, turned it over, did it again, uh, and uh, you know, it's 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 not it's often cool. personal experience. It's 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 its own kind of encounter with the world and language and. Uh, that idea of following the language wherever it wants to lead. Yeah. Right, I, right. I, I agree with that 100%. But I have said to, to my students too, you know, there are things in the world just calling to you to write about them. And they do look at me like, are you, are you kind of out of your mind? You know, are you yes. a mystic? And I'm not really saying that, but there are things that you see every day, a small thing that is waiting 
I really believe that. And you have to, that's why I think noticing is so important and watching it's, you know, open up your pores and let, let things be there for you. Thanks. I, I mean, I, uh, that's a great, those are great answers to a, a tough question. Um, <laughs> and I really like the idea of, you know, of not thinking of sources as some kind of mystical origin, but just the, thinking about arrays of types of language um, or, you know, the mundane things that you can draw on. One of the, one of the things that unites your poetry, um, as I was listening to it, uh, is an interest in the more than human world, um, which many of us are interested in, and, and um, not necessarily giving voice to it, but, but nonetheless um, letting it speak. And I connect this, Patricia, to your emphasis on seeing well. So I'm, I guess my question is, you know, how do you, we have, we have limited ways of seeing, how do you sort of uh, represent, an, say, animals or the mountain, right? Um, knowing that you, you see in a, a very particular, particular way. How do you get outside of yourself and, and put that on the page? Mm -hmm. Well, that's tough, isn't it? Because um, we're, we're limited and, and the longer we live in the world and we deal with conflict and different cultural groups, we know how limited and maybe privileged a particular view is. And so, I don't know, I think reading is the, is the answer really because we know so little an individual and, um, and by reading, I just finished the new book, the new novel by Anthony Doerr called Cloud Cuckoo Land. <clears throat> and it's really an incredible book that goes from Constantinople to Idaho and different centuries. And you end up, uh, the characters are so great and you end up with sympathies outside what you didn't expect, people that you sympathize with. And I think maybe that's the answer. We're in danger trying to write about animals because I think we know so little. Um, but with reading and imagination and, and reading some science, we can kind of learn um, we just should be way more humble about pronouncing than we are. And I, I think a lot of people are pretty humble. I think poets are, and fiction writers, and nonfiction writers. I've got to read Heather's book about the bees. That sounds really great. But I don't know if I've answered that. Let's hear from David, too. How do you get inside the mountain? And uh, Well, I, I, I think, first of all, you, you try to know as much as you possibly can about the thing yeah. that you feel sympathy for. Uh, and, uh, but it is about acknowledging the autonomy and agency of things that we don't typically recognize as a subject, but as an object, you know. Uh, but what happens if the mountain is a subject? What if we are an object it observes, you know? Uh, and uh, sure, um, uh, the uh, there is there is some there, there there are some blind leaps one makes in the faith one has in human language to speak <laughs> uh, accurately uh, to describe the world as you think it is, uh, or even better, as it is. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that I, I've experienced, especially during this COVID uh, era, when, uh, you know, I've been so alone in this place, is that I, the animals recognize me as, as much as I recognize them. I know who the bear is that's living here uh, this year. Um, uh, who the bears were last year. I know which one of them died, you know, which, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The birds, they, they're the same birds every day. Uh, they live here. Uh, <laughs> and they don't seem to be too troubled by us generally, you know, and so you realize that, in fact, everyone sees everyone else. And I think that is the, that is the, you talk about humility is that when you realize you look at the world, well, the world is looking back at you too, you know, and, uh, and uh, they have their thoughts, obviously, uh, whatever they might be. 
And so just trying to imagine a language, that's really the, the, that's really the trick, but the language is there. I mean, it's our tool, um, you know, and uh, it's a good tool. We're lucky to have it. Yes. Yeah. I love the idea of, you know, the, to, to really see others or see from their perspective, you have to see yourself, right? And um, get, it, get, out, get outside yourself. Um, there's a real complexity there. To, to, to kind of follow up on this question, that both of you mentioned how you, you know, follow the sound of, of a poem, um, but that, but that carry you in in the drafting and in thinking about you know um, what it produces, how it represents. Um, do you find yourself then kind of actively skeptical of the sound, which can take you to meanings you don't necessarily mean in the in the moment? What what's the tension there that you work out in revision, if at all? Hmm. Sorry, uh, is, does that, is that question clear? No, it's not, no, it's not a weird question. It's a good question. Good one, yeah. uh, and it's, it's a dangerous one. I mean, I'm gonna have to answer this. <laughs> I, you know what, if, if the sound, uh, I mean, I, I, I am in love with the, uh, uh, rolling the vocables, uh, as they say, and uh, I, I can't get enough of it. I, I admire my, some of my older colleagues who still like to rhyme. I mean, uh, I think uh, Robert Wrigley, man, he, he writes the best rhymed poems. Uh, you know, but they fall into, you know, a, a shape pretty quickly. But uh, I, uh, I think the lyric poem has a lot of space for us to, uh, to, to sing to make uh, sounds uh, uh, that are, uh, are lovely. And, um, and if, I'm not sure I feel a tension uh, between meaning and sound. I, I, I trust the language to mean what it, what it intends. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think as, as Patricia is saying, the more I'm aware that I'm writing a poem, probably the more I'm lousing it up. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, but if the, la the language likes to sing to itself and uh, I, 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 the more song-like a poem is for me, uh, the happier I am, frankly. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I suppose the tension is meaningless sound or, or getting to something that isn't satisfying. I'm not a language poet. I don't wanna just make random sounds I like words really um so you know there you do struggle with wanting to say something but Hugo was so adamant that if you he, he said that philosophy students were his worst students because they had ideas and that was <laughs> <laughs> and he and they had a message yeah. they wanted to send and he said you should you should send a telegram of course telegrams are gone but um you know that isn't what poems were about so um you know i think the tension is following the sound and not being satisfied somehow or getting there and saying what will the reader think of this you know is it is it satisfying I mean, we have intellect too, but I, I, I think Hugo, he was really right about the deeper intonations of sound and what they, what they could get you to, I think. Um, he did some rhyming too, didn't he? Yeah. A couple of villanelles. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, it's, it's a good question. Did we answer it? Yeah, I, did I, we? I think, I think you did. Uh, I mean, something <laughs> I, I wonder about in nonfiction, do I get carried into meanings I, I should quarrel with more, right, by sound? And I don't, I, there's no good answer. And, you know, there's, it's-, it's Your descriptions are beautiful in, in, in nonfiction. I don't think you're doing any harm to anything in your writing that I have ever <laughs> I've observed. I, you're doing it a great honor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's, that's a compliment. <laughs> appreciate it. Um, a a, a follow-up uh, question from the audience. Um, 
Uh, I wonder also about image, how to follow it and the process for noticing and attending to images. Hmm. Hmm. So the question is, how, how do we follow an image? Is it, and how do we recognize the image to follow? And, and let me know. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, or, or how, uh, you know, maybe one image is born of, of the next. Uh, another extremely difficult open-ended question, I think, but I'd be interested to hear. Uh, I, I think one of the things we were we maybe a sort of alluding to um, um, about sound and imagery, um, what I uh, personally, and I, I, I imagine this is broadly shared experience, uh, the, the, the less expected, uh, the, the turn, uh, the way a poem turns down the page, um, uh, the more exciting <laughs> it is to write and uh, much more exciting it is to read um, and, I, and, and to say aloud. Um, and I, I, um, that's how, I know is that um, I mean from a, like a lot of times what I what I get caught up in is that I am so damn I want to be so damn precise <laughs> I want to it's like the image I never let go of the damn thing you know uh, it's like you could back up about oh four or five six lines uh, I, I you know it, it's resonant enough as an image. Uh, and it, it just slows things down. So, you know, a lot of times I'm, I'm fine tuning that sort of thing at the level of image is like, how much information do they really need here at Florod? Uh, uh, and, and, but it's that surprise that, that really causes excitement uh, that the way, you know, images churn through a poem. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think, I think there may be, uh, you know, image clusters, does it all, is it all of the natural world or, or because sometimes a, a juxtaposition that's surprising is really a delightful thing. All of a sudden there's a plastic bag or there's something else that's not, not of the other thing. So um, I guess that's an ear thing too, um, that it, even though it's a sight thing, an image, but there's a, there's a paying attention to one's work that would say it's time for a more of a surprise here um, in terms of an image. And maybe the reader will get it. Maybe it, it is um, belaboring a point or something to continue with the image. I don't know. You want people to see what you see, but you know, you might have to cut, cut your losses at some point and move on. So. Reading things out loud, I think, Nick, is, is one thing that, you know, because if you sense that little bit of lagging interest, it, you've got to do something different. And um, if we're honest, I've been struggling with a poem the last few days and something's just not right. And I, I really don't know what it is. So reading it over or or writing it out over and over, because I write by longhand, then I start to know I'm, I'm boring myself or something isn't right here and I better do something different. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks Bill so said that, you know, he, 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 he was ranting and raving one night. He says, someone's boring me and I think it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? It's a really good criteria for judging one's work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's I'm boring myself. It's hard to admit, you know, we're, you know, at least it's hard for me to admit. So that, that seems like a, a important barometer. Don't don't bore yourself. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, thanks. So thanks so much. A, a follow up. Another question from the audience from uh, Alexander. Patricia, in your work, I noticed some narrative technique. How do you approach using narrative and poetry and still have it sound and feel like poetry. Yeah, that's really good. I, 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 we recently had Ellen Bass come to campus and I, um, I was really impressed with her use of narrative in poems and it's, it's really tough. Um, I forget what your question was. How do you use it? How do you 
learn about it. Yeah, I, I, I think I, th I think it's a gauge also of how much information does the reader know and and when do you know that you can cut away from the narrative and they're still going to follow you. You're going to go along and then you're going to come back and give them some more information. And um, it's practice and it's reading other people. Um, I've been reading the poet Linda Gregerson and how she'll weave like three different stories together. And you think, what in the hell is she doing? And um, she she pulls it off, takes you into the past and then brings you back. and. And uh, you, you just have to kind of dole out some of the details and get people to follow you along and then, and then still have some music in there so that the lyrical quality, you don't want to be plodding. I think that's the trouble I'm having with this poem I'm working on is it's gotten to be kind of plodding and I've got to cut more. So I might have to go in and with a knife and excise things. <laughs> Narrative is tricky. Yeah, yeah. I, I What you say about Ellen Bass is true. I mean, gosh, uh, but like good narrative poets, they've got a, they've got a pulse going in their, in their lines. And that is the great tool poets possess, uh, uh, being able to write in a rhythm and to break a line. Um, you can make silences in, 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 uh, in a poem more easily than in, a, um, in prose, I suppose. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that, and with Dick, I mean, Dick was a pretty narrative poet a lot of times. And, but it was just, he always had, uh, he just had that thump, thump, thump going all the way through. It's like listening to someone with their car stereo go by, you know, that was yeah. always there in the poem. And, uh, and it, it really impelled it. Uh, and yeah, uh, I, think, I that... think of degrees of gray in Phillipsburg, which I could still hear, you know, you might come here Sunday on a whim, say your life broke down. And, you know, he's got this rhythm going and you just can't get it out of your head. You've yeah. got to follow it along. And then he does have a deep a story too of this woe begotten town and this person. It's, uh, it's impressive how he weaves it together. So maybe, maybe sound becomes a, an important part of narrative in a poem, right? To, to give it an extra kind of life that you may not quite feel on a broader scope of, a, of prose. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, narrative poetry traditionally was played with a uh, drum, you know, uh, so th there's a reason for that. I, I, and I imagine we are the inheritors of it. Yeah, we had someone come here who was doing um, the Odyssey out loud and playing and using the drum. And that drum was electrifying to the story. I, I, it, was, it was Stanley Lombardo and he did a really fantastic job. And um, so that does tell you something. Again, you have to educate yourself as a writer and learn more techniques, I guess. That's why it takes a long time to be a good writer, <laughs> right? <laughs> no one's dying to it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, one one final question I think um, for you, and thanks for those questions from the audience. Um, which is, uh, you know, you you both have books out with with Terrapin books, um, and you're reading from Heather's uh, too. And one of the things I'm interested in is is how um, you know a publishing house can can become a kind of community. Um, do you, is, that, is that something that you have sought in your, in your publishing? Uh, is it something that's, that you, is truly, you feel with Terrapin? What, what can be said about the way um, uh, you know, a, a press can be a, and create community? I can say two things about that. Uh, I mean, I'm new to Terrapin, uh, and uh, but uh, 
it's just the fact that, you know, like, like Terrapin jumped uh, in front of me one day and I said, well, what's all about Terrapin? And then I saw Patricia and I saw Heather and I was like, oh, well, uh, uh, there's a community there of uh, people I respect, uh, I know, et cetera. Um, but it lost horse. I mean, it was the same way. I mean, uh, uh, being able to meet Melissa Kwasny and read with her, uh, whose uh, first book came out uh, uh, from them. And then, of course, Tom Aslan published a book with them. Um, uh, and so uh, Piotr uh, Florschik. Uh, I mean, there are all these writers with whom you suddenly uh, find yourself uh, having a shared interest and uh, whose work uh, you begin to care about deeply and want to promote and help in any way you can. And, uh, and certainly uh, working as a, an editor uh, with, uh, or you know, a contributing editor with Lynx House, uh, it's very much the same. Uh, uh, you, you meet people, uh, I mean, someone handed me a manuscript on the street corner in Pennsylvania two weeks ago. <laughs> and now, and now wow. the editor, you know, and I said, well, just give me your manuscript. I'll just pass it along. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you know, communities get built that way, I suppose. And yeah, it, it's nice. Yeah, and there you never know how long lasting it is because there's there's certainly a lot of flux in the in the publishing world. But I think Diane Lockwood has has done a, a good job of um, getting her poets together and encouraging them. She's really a big fan of social media and really wants her writers to get some visibility there. I, I get weary myself of social media, but I think it's a necessary evil in a lot of ways. Um, so, but yes, we get to meet um, fellow writers and, and then read their work and come to admire their work. And it's, it's a good thing. It's another good reason why AWP is pretty delightful when it works, I think, because uh, Diane has had some group readings there and it's pretty great. Yeah. Sure. So. <clears throat> well, it seems like you've, you've got a really good group at Terrapin Books and, um, uh, you know, I look forward to exploring their catalog, their, their array of poets further. Um, thank you both so much for a wonderful afternoon. I, I just really enjoyed your readings. Um, thanks to our audience and, and thanks, uh, thanks to Devon too, who is in the background. Um, right. Thank him a lot. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, kept us together for about a hundred years now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, we'll hope to see, see you both soon uh, one way or the other. Um, appreciate everyone. We're going to say goodbye for now and continue this conversation down the line. Okay, Thank great. Thank Take you. Care, it's delightful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.